Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this second edition of the Euronaval Talks. For those of you who couldn't join us for the first one, which took place on the 13th of June this year, uh, this is a new sort of event that we at Euronaval have decided to organize to maintain and uh, foster interesting and challenging conversations on naval warfare in the 21st century. Now, whereas in the first edition we uh, focused very much on sort of what naval warfare in the 21st century means, so uh, challenges and also technologies to tackle these challenges at large, for this second edition we decided to take a deep dive into a topic that is very much occupying the minds of many of our uh, politicians and navies at the moment, which is seabed warfare. And to do so, I have with me in Paris today, where actually Euronaval does take place, uh, four esteemed um, experts. So allow me to introduce them to you at once. I have here with me Rear Admiral Cédric Chetay. Cédric Chetay is Deputy Commander in charge of seabed warfare. And with Cédric, we will be discussing the French seabed warfare strategy. Hi, Cédric. Hi, hi, Alex. Very nice to have you here. Good afternoon. Uh, and then we also have with us today Patrick O'Keefe. Uh, advisor for the Institute for Security Policy at Keele University. And Patrick is an expert in space technologies and will be uh, very patiently answering all our questions on how space and seabed warfare actually tie in together. Hi, Patrick. Hi, thank you for being on board. It's a pleasure. And then also today with us, we have Oha Nashbander. Um, Executive Vice President Drones, Autonomous Systems and Underwater Weapons at Naval Group. And with OHA, we will be taking a deep dive into what Naval Group has to offer in terms of autonomous systems and um, what's going on in that space. Hi, OHA. Hi, Alex. Did I pronounce your surname correctly? Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, uh, we also have Joseba Batena, whom I'm referring to as Joe today. Thank you. Um, commercial Director at Forces, and Joe will be the one explaining to ha us how all these systems can communicate together, posi position each other on the water because of all the challenges that we will be exploring throughout our talk today. Now, it's a pleasure to share this virtual and physical space with you all today. And before we dive into what will certainly be a very interesting conversation, I just wanted to remind our audience that this is very much a lively debate. Uh, so we'll be debating here in Paris, but we also would like you to be part of this debate. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask, please send them uh, through the little box, chat box that we'll, you will have on your platform. And I will receive them here on my little screen and make sure to pass them along as we're discussing with the experts today. Now, without further ado, I would like to kick off the conversation and start with Rear Admiral Cédric Chetay and talk about the French seabed warfare strategy. So, Cédric, I, this is one proud moment for the for French that I am, that we are. Uh, we are one of the very few countries to have a, perhaps the only one, to have a seabed warfare strategy, right? Yes, that's right. I mean, the, the Ministry of uh, Armed Forces in France released this strategy one year and a half ago in February 2022. But um, it was the, 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 the achievement of a long process and of uh, growing interest actually from, uh, from our military and strategist and uh, analyst, uh, an an analyst in, 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 the, in the ministry to, to what was uh, actually going on uh, in, the, in the deep sea, on the sea floor, in the, in the seabed warfare, on the seabed warfare. So I have a slide. Can we show the image for that to remind uh, people who are listening today? Uh, the series of events that, uh, that are already known uh, by, by the public, but uh, that can uh, help us to understand what's the challenging, uh, challenges going on in, in, this, in this domain. So remember that, so you remember this uh, Russian flag? So it was 15 year, more than 15 years ago, actually, uh, when the Russians were able to, to plant in um, this flag uh, on the seafloor, and we are by more than uh, 4,000 meters there. So we, I think that we must recall and remember what was a strategic signal by this kind of uh, activity. So at that time, uh, France and the um, European nations were not able to, to, to do the same uh, by this uh, very deep uh, depth. Um, uh, for the French Navy, a real shock was the recovery of the Minerve of submarine. So we are now in 2019. In 2019, we wanted to, to, 
to provide a proper uh, sepulture to the to the seamen who, who died on board the submarine. And it was so difficult to find this, uh, this uh, wreck, which was somewhere off the Toulon coast, so not that far, uh, but we were unable to find it. And in very few time, uh, the private company that we contracted that uh, was able to find the submarine. So there was a, a, at that time a shock saying that, hey, uh, there's something which, uh, which is missing in our capabilities in the French Navy, and we need to, to reconquer uh, this, uh, this ability to go really deep. So other pictures are, of course, uh, a wreck of, uh, of a F-35 that, uh, that was lost uh, in the Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, Sea, uh, South China Sea, uh, two or three years ago, I don't remember exactly. And of course, when you have this kind of uh, wreck, very sensitive with very sensitive materials on the, to on the bottom of the sea, of course, you want, you want to be sure that uh, it will not uh, be in wrong hands. And of course, the last uh, picture, maybe uh, the most well known for the public, uh, is uh, the, the North Stream uh, sabotage. So all these events, you know, you can see that um, there was the need to to be able to first understand what was the the challenges uh, that we had to address mm -hmm. uh, in that domain, in that new domain, and and also the long way that we have to take to be able to to understand, to monitor, to operate in that domain. Um, to complement that, I would like also, before talking about the, the strategy uh, later on, but uh, I would like to, to, to give maybe an overview of what we call uh, the, the seabed warfare or the deep sea or the, or the, 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 the seafloor uh, activities. So when we are talking about the deep sea, that means that it's really deep. It's from the shore, but it's up to uh, 6,000 meters Depth. So, uh, with that, with that figures, you normally are able to 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 cover um, ninety seven percent of the of the ocean. Uh, but going to more than uh, some hundred meters, uh, that means that you really need to have proper capabilities um, that it n that are not very well uh, spread over uh, in in modern even in modern navies. And you need to have specific know-hows um, to, to, to operate there. Second, if it is deep, that means that it favors uh, opacity and hybrid activities. Mm -hmm. So, of course, this is the challenge of that space. It is very similar to what we can see in the cyberspace. You can easily hide um, uh, the legal status. So I don't know if maybe uh, one of us here is a better expert than I am in the in the legal uh, status of the open seas and of the seabed. Um, but there are there very, very difficult, again, very difficult challenges. There are different uh, opinions and interests that are in conflict. And there's no international recognized position about the status of uh, some part of the large part of the, of the seabed. So all that also uh, uh, favors uh, dual activities and strategic competition between all the actors able to operate there. So um, the second thing uh, uh, was that by chance, I would say, we were lucky enough in France to have um, uh, other actors, non-military non actors uh, in that domain that were leaders, world leaders in a way, in, the, in their domain. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, scientific uh, institute like IFREMER, mm -hmm. uh, who for instance uh, are operating uh, AUVs, so autonomous underwater vehicles that are going also very deep. Uh, last week uh, they released a, uh, a short uh, uh, media um, uh, communicate saying that they were able, that th their UAV were tested by 6,000 6, meters for instance. They also operate uh, a small submarine, uh, and this submarine is the only one in Europe able to, to, to also to dive to that uh, kind of depth. So, Ifremer, we have also um, uh, other scientific researchers, uh, um, scientific uh, institutes, uh, also private companies, leaders in cable industries, in oil and gas undersea activities. So all that ecosystem was able to provide us the basis on which we were able to build a, a proper strategy. Uh, first, to, to map mm -hmm. uh, 
the, the, the area of interest and then to, to draw uh, our road to, to uh, being uh, real uh, actors and credible actors in that domain. Okay, well, thank you very much for this, uh, this comprehensive introduction, Cédric. I really appreciate it. Now, in the images that you showed us, you know, we can see a, a robot arm putting a, a flag. We can see, uh, as you said, the, the remains of a submarine, the remains of an F-35. We can see uh, the uh, damage from the gas prom. So, seabed warfare, as with every, you know, key word that comes up, pops up in the political world, has been used in all kinds of ways at this point in time. So, perhaps could you give us a bit of an introduction as to what it means in the framework of the seabed warfare strategy in France? What do we understand as seabed warfare? For sure, for sure. Um, so, um, I would like to, um, so it's, it's a little bit uh, to, to synthesize and, and to make it simple for everybody to split um, these activities and, and the focus of the strategy into two different parts. Mm -hmm. So first, uh, our interests in terms of infrastructure. So uh, France, like other European countries, like countries all over the world, need to be able to use openly, freely, uh, the, the seafloor uh, for the infrastructure. So we are here talking about uh, cables for communication or for um, energy transport uh, and we're talking about pipes for all our gas uh, supply. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> again, it's very easy to, to understand the, 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 the stake there with, with the North Stream, with what happened to, to North Stream, where a very uh, uh, easy, uh, easy action, I would, I would say simple action, had some strategic uh, overcomes. Um, so uh, I remember when I first uh, hear about ca communication cables, you know, cables, I would say something like 12 years ago. So it was a topic, you know, um, with a lot of uh, uh, secrecy around there. Oh, you should not speak about that. You know, it's very sensitive. Okay, and five, four years ago, it became something like, oh yes, cables, of course, that's important, but you know, the network is so robust, there's so many uh, ways to, to, to support redundancy to the system. So, uh, it's not really a, 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 a real concern, you know. Um, but now, with the development of uh, uh, AI, with, with all the data process that, uh, that uh, modernity and modern life and economic life uh, request, um, we see that the cables able to support this activity, um, we don't have that much, actually. Mm. So, so again, the, the communication cables, um, I think that we can speak about strategic and critical infrastructure when we speak about that. Um, so, there is a protection of our ability to, to, to make that uh, ecosystem w properly work. Um, and there is also another, another domain which is more linked to um, uh, the military and naval activities at sea, which is to be able to keep our freedom with, so I'm sorry, maybe I, I use some uh, very specific uh, or military terms, but we speak about freedom of action. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I need to explain that. It, 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 it's quite uh, understandable for, for everybody. Um, if the, if uh, some uh, uh, actors are able to to have surveillance from the seabed, uh, are able to to put some weapons to weaponize uh, the seabed. Of course, it's easy to understand uh, the kind of threat that we can have to face uh, in terms of uh, free access to the open sea for our um, our, our naval forces. So. These are mainly the two legs on which we had to build uh, our strategy. Mm -hmm. So before actually going into our strategies and the challenges, I sort of wanted to take a little segue and ask Patrick as the German resident today in our, at, our, at our studio, is this a similar understanding in Germany? Is this, are you looking at somewhat the similar issues? What is the situation in Germany? Yeah, so to that topic, actually, um, the situation with North Stream one year ago was kind of a wake-up call in a German environment, in a political environment, but also in the technical discussions about what, is, uh, what kind of capabilities do we actually have to monitor an area 
like the Baltic Sea, the North Sea, and we are not talking about uh, the Atlantic yet, you know, South Atlantic and so on, even just the, in comparison rather smaller Baltic Sea. And it shows, uh, has shown us in that time um, that we are vulnerable. Vulnerable not only by something is happening that has an influ influence on the critical infrastructure, maritime critical infrastructure, but also on the general situation awareness of mm -hmm. the actors, who is doing what, when, where. Mm -hmm. Can we answer those questions adequately? Mm -hmm. And at least from the German perspective, when you follow the German uh, discussions, um, uh, obviously not, not so easy. Mm -hmm. And we definitely need to come to a point where not from the German perspective, but in general from a perspective when something has happened, we need to answer those questions. We should be able, in a, in a from a capability standpoint, to follow actions at the moment and can kind of adequately assess the risk and mitigate the risks mm -hmm. and in the best case actually to predict risks to even say okay what kind of potential does this behavior have in the future i'm talking about is this action uh, on top of sea cables south of great britain for example also last year in august is this something that uh, poses a risk mm -hmm. to our critical infrastructure yes or no we need to answer those questions not by based on emotions based on data mm -hmm. and uh, that's my little bit longer answer to your question. No, no, it's good, it's good. Thank you very much. And Joe, maybe I don't know if you want to talk about it from a perspective in, I know you're based in the UK, yeah. so in terms of industry, what have you heard? What kind of perspectives? Yeah, I, I don't think I can talk for the UK, uh, right. but I, I can certainly sort of have a, take a view from industry. And I think uh, we find ourselves right now where the conflict uh, is showing us that uncrewed systems are now are now viable and um, and and I think the underwater domain is a, is the next stage for that, and it, it poses many challenges. I don't think navies navies traditionally have been looking how to looking at how they remain quiet when mm -hmm. they're operating underwater, mm -hmm. but now if we're going to have to operate underwater through for extensive periods of times, so we're going to have to find new ways of doing that. You know, we're just not going to be able to support crude systems underwater for extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. And that's going to require for us to communicate. Um, so these are new challenges for the Navy, but I, I think uh, Cedric pointed out earlier, um, you know, industry has been there. You know, the, the, the oil and gas industry, uh, one of our technology partners, Sonardyne, they've been uh, supporting navigation and communications in thousands of meters of depth. You know, uh, oil wells get built at 2,000, 3,000 meters. Uh, the equipment is commercial off the shelf available at 6,000 meter depth rating. Um, so, so, so the technology is there. The, the, the question that remains to be answered is how do we adapt that technology to the new requirement, the new needs, um, which I think, you know, until very recently, nobody even was thinking about, you know. A, a few years ago, this, this was not in our you know, in our mindset. So, mm -hmm. but, but I think, yeah, there's technology there that can help us get there quicker. We just need to work together, industry and navies, to, to make that transition. Okay, thank you, thank you, Joe. Thank you. And since you've introduced the, the topic yeah. of industry, and before going back to Cédric, I wanted to know if Oha, from the French industry perspective, from Naval Group, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, sure. Uh, it will be uh, only complementary to what was said before, because I, I, I agree with uh, all uh, that was said. But um, the way we see nav naval operations, it's also uh, becoming more and more complex, more and more collaborative uh, and, and in a multi-domain uh, environment. So uh, when you chose the, the title of these uh, talks, it was uh, really important to, to understand that now uh, naval, naval operations come from the seabed to the space. Um, and yes, I, I agree, Uncru uh, crewed uh, ships are more and more complemented with uncrewed uh, systems. And, and there will be more and more systems in the air, above and under the sea. So one of the challenges with, will also be to have them all work together, communicate together, uh, avoid um, collision, uh, and, and, and really work in a distributed manner so that we can have all the uh, interests of such solutions. So in Naval Group, we have set a, a strategic priority to uh, invest in uh, uncrewed systems, mm -hmm. but also uh, we, we try to push uh, at the same time the systems of system uh, approach and have a global understanding of the overall architecture 
that uh, is, uh, is raised about these new challenges. Thank you. And I think this sets really nicely the tone for the conversations we'll be having today from the space to the seabed. Uh, so let's go back to you, Cédric, in terms of the French um, seabed warfare strategy. Are there some key tenets, key pillars that you would like to talk to us about in terms of the strategy of the challenges that you've identified? Yes, for sure. Um, uh, so I think what is important to understand is that we don't have the ambition to be able, you know, to to, to monitor uh, what is happening uh, permanently uh, on the seabed uh, from uh, from the mid-Atlantic to the French coast or, or in French Polynesia or something like that. No, 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 no. This this something like that is is not uh, is not actually it's not our mission. Um, what we want to do, we want to to do just like uh, uh, Patrick said before. Uh, we want to be able to monitor and to understand what is going on. And uh, if possible, um, to, to, to act where we consider it is important for our understanding, for keeping, uh, maintaining our freedom of, uh, of uh, action, uh, we want to be able to, to act. So it can be, you know, acting um, defensively, in, in a defensive mode, I mean, or it can be also, of course, when we speak about uh, military strategies or military tactics, it can be more offensive in a way that we want to, to be able to, to, to maintain our ability to deploy our forces. So this is the st there, there are the three pillars of our strategies uh, to understand, to monitor, and to, and to take action when needed or, or when request. For doing that, we need, um, and it, uh, I think it's an important point also to develop, we need a, 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 a partnership amongst the different actors that, that I've mentioned before. But first, uh, uh, between the different actors of the Ministry of Armed Forces in France. Mm -hmm. Because it's not only uh, a topic for the Navy. It is a, first, it is a joint topic, I would say. Uh, but you see, there is also a very important intelligence dimension in that. There is um, a question about uh, the, the, the legal uh, status of different zones at sea. So um, there's also a procurement uh, challenge there. Um, and, and actually, uh, all that can be coordinated by the Navy mm -hmm. at the end. Um, but it's not, it's not only a Navy uh, object. Um, so this is the second aspect of the strategy. And the, and the, the third aspect of the strategy is to develop uh, some uh, um, sharings and, and partnership with allies uh, and partners all around the world, because this is a topic that has interest not only for us, uh, France, not only for us European nations, but for a lot of uh, countries in the world, because we are all facing the same, uh, the same threats or the same issues. And so this also, uh, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, um, very important. We will not succeed in our strategy if, if we neglect this, uh, this uh, dimension of, of partnerships. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I know that um, procurement is a, would be a topic for a round table in and of itself. So we're definitely not sure. going to delve into that, I think. Uh, and also we have industry, so this may become a very heated debate. <laughs> Uh, but in terms of, um, you know, uh, both Aurore and Joe have hinted to what uh, they have seen from the industry point of view. Uh, I was curious if you could tell us a little bit in terms of the strategy, in terms of the Marine Nationale and the French mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. What have you identified in terms of technologies, uh, trends and anything that can help with this strategy and with these um, challenges? Yes, yes for sure. Um, Actually, uh, why there is a, such a focus on the on the sea, what what I call seabed warfare on on, on, on the deep sea? It's also because uh, technology right now um, uh, is at a momentum where um, you can you can really step up um, to towards uh, being more. Uh, I would say I would not say easily, but it's 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 easier to be to be able to 
to operate in that domain than it was uh, still uh, 10 years ago. Why? Because of, of the digitalization of the oceans that is currently going on, because of the treatment of the data, because of the big data process, because of the inter in, in artificial intelligence, um, and, and because of uh, the, the progress that were made on, on the batteries, for instance, etc. So, so the technologies are now more mature to be able to, to operate there. Uh, so the ambitions of the, of the French Navy, the ambition of the French Navy, as it is written in the strategy, is to be able to operate up to 6,000 uh, meters with uh, AUVs that I mentioned before and with um, robots uh, remotely operated vehicles, or, uh, uh, ROVs, um, uh, in, I would say, everywhere in the world. Our main um, uh, areas of interest are the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Sea, but not only, you know that France is a maritime nation in the way that we the second EEZ in the world. Uh, we also have interest and, uh, and sovereignty stakes to, to preserve and to protect uh, in the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, uh, and, uh, and population actually to, to, to serve and to protect in those areas. So, so um, th there's, a, there's not a focus in very specific uh, areas in the world. Uh, we want also to be able to operate everywhere. Of course, we will not be able to do that <laughs> next week or even next year. Um, so there's, there's a roadmap, of course, uh, to, beef up, to beef up our, our capabilities. Uh, and the recent uh, uh, pr uh, programs and procurement uh, law that was voted by the French Parliament uh, before summer uh, is, is the main, uh, the main uh, vehicles which will allow us to, to procure this, uh, these uh, capabilities. Right. And I know we could discuss this for, for a very long time. Uh, I know we have a, we received a question from the audience, actually, um, which is someone is asking how to be sure that um, SSBN patrol areas uh, are not surveyed from the bottom of the sea. So is it technically possible to install and operate an efficient survey system at the bottom of the ocean? So this is to you, but if anyone here wants to take this question also, I'm very happy to have your points of view. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so this, this is a good question, uh, of course, and it's, it's exactly uh, what I was saying about when I was uh, talking uh, about uh, freedom of action. So I would like first to reassure uh, your listener about uh, the, 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 the security and the of, of the patrol of our SSBNs. I, th I think that there's many ways to be sure that uh, they operate uh, um, uh, the full, uh, their full capabilities and uh, they achieve every, every of their mission. Um, but uh, that said, of course, it is something that this is one of the scenarios that we could face. Uh, and to be sure, so to be sure that there's what, what what is on the on the seafloor? We don't need to to go to the seafloor uh, and explore everywhere. Of course, this is a mix of capabilities. This is a mix of space capabilities. This is a main so means a mix of uh, surveillance capabilities from very various uh, uh, assets. This is why I was mentioning the intelligence dimension in this strategy, mm. because you don't need to operate on the deep sea to be sure of what is going on on the, on the deep sea. So, so. Um, yeah, this, this is my answer to this question. OK. Anybody else wants to venture in an answer? Or yeah, I, I would sure. just say that the technology exists today where you can go as deep as you want and get centimetric, millimetric pictures, 3D reconstructions using optical systems, lasers. Um, so in terms of being able to get all the data that you want at whatever resolution, the technology is there. Like Cedric says, is that the right thing to do? Probably not. You'd be spending a lot of money and a lot of time. Um, certainly, th 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 we need to be looking at how how we monitor. And but then, if there is an instance where you do discover something and you do want to go and take a closer look, the technology is there. So you know, I, th I think it's a question of finding that balance as to when do we need to go and look at something, what technology we deploy to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but. But uh, it, it needs to be a, a more um, 
yeah, the, the balance has to be more towards like making sure there's nobody getting in there in the first place versus, you know, let's try and look at everything in the Atlantic Ocean because that would be, you know, yeah. a never ending task. Good luck with yeah. that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, you, you've mentioned looking at from many different angles and Cedric also, you've rightly mentioned looking at it from very different uh, perspectives as well. So I think this is the perfect cue for starting to drill Patrick. You know, I mean, we're talking about seabed warfare here and suddenly we have someone who's an expert on space technologies. So could you perhaps tell us and a bit in the audience, what's the link there? How does that work? Yeah, um, I would like to explain satellite imagery, space systems and so on. They are kind of a tool set that can be used to bring light into the darkness. For example, if uh, the Earth's uh, surface is covered by 70% by the ocean, as mentioned before, by the current technology, we can cover and monitor areas, but not everything at the same time with the same focus. Um, satellite imagery is a just another tool set that can come into the place and is very handy at the moment, um, used wisely. It can bring us to the next level. And that can actually be one of the pillars for the various strategies as the French strategy, but others to come. In particular, what I'm saying here is, for example, um, if you want to know what's going on underwater, you need definitely need to know what's going on on the surface. Mm. It's like an equation or like an order of logic here. It's based on experience in the Baltic, North Sea and so on. Um, we are not gathering data j just since yesterday. Uh, we are doing this for many decades already in different means. There's expertise already in the navies and also not in the navies, also in the coast guards and so on and so on in the authorities. But now there is, we are at a position at a time uh, where we need to combine these efforts in a different way. Uh, by jurisdiction, but also by information sharing. Coming from an environment, talking about a sea cable was secret. You, you, you did not do this. Mm -hmm. uh, you haven't done this in, in a setup like this. You talked only under in the secured areas and so on, even though the position of the sea cables is publicly known, right? So just by inheritance, it was no secret information. But now we're in a, in a time where we can finally talk about this. We can approach companies. We can talk about this, what we need. Companies need to know what we need in order to get to the next level. And for example, it's not only by taking pictures from the oceans and trying to figure out if there's a ship on, on, uh, on the surface, it's also to understanding the pattern of these um, objects, of the actors at sea. Have they been there before? That's going back also to the question, to install a system on a seabed. I, I mean, there are technical means out there, but it needs logistical support. And to find out if that has happened in a specific area, you can actually use satellite systems to follow back in the history to see if somebody has been operating in that area and may have deployed something. Then you can focus your resources, your limited fo your forces, resources. And I want to finish with this one, saying instead of sending a ship with 200 persons on board somewhere to inspect something, you might think they're just a tip and cue, but probability there is something. Uncrewed systems, they're a solution. Okay. And satellite imagery, you can point and flash light in a direction, say, please have a look over there without sending so many people on a ship to that place in terms of limited resources and personnel. Thank you, Patrick. And I think this really is interesting because I know off, uh, off air we were discussing this before and you were, you were saying quite rightly um, that if you send the big ships, the big guns, immediately you might scare off whoever is doing whatever they're doing. And then in that case, you have no way of catching them red handed or of knowing exactly what their intention might have been. So I was wondering um, in this context, you know, uh, what does it mean in terms of what you've been working on, what you've been developing? Yeah, um, good point actually. For example, last week um, there was a uh, naval exercise or experimentation phase south of uh, Lisbon where we experimented with different setups of anchored systems, robots underwater and so on and so on with different um, equipment for underwater situation awareness and surface situation awareness. In that context, for example, we tested how to implement and integrate satellite imagery, space mm -hmm. systems, but not only f uh, pictures, but also different technologies that are just coming on the market right now coming, for example, by, um, I mean, synthetic aperture radar scans, SIR, it's nothing new, but it was very secretive in the, ti in the previous times. But now there are commercial actors who had the, uh, well, um, who, who did the step to create their own commercially available satellite system. So it's not owned by the governments anymore, so they can sell the data, but we governmental entities can come back and ask for the data and to edit, add it to our repertoire of information. And also not only by imagery, like 
electro-optical or synthetic Apache radar, but also radar frequency scans. Very helpful in wide areas. Uh, for example, French company Unseen Labs was very helpful to test these systems for us, brand new technology. And that goes bo by uh, both sides. We need to test it, but also the companies need to adjust it so we can use it. And not only military, but also governmental uh, authorities. So I always want to highlight it's not only the military aspect here, the defense aspect is also kind of the policing aspect, uh, jurisdiction at the high seas and so on and so on, blue justice. These are just some words that are developing more and more and getting more importance in these times. Mm, a lot of key words there to yeah. impact. <laughs> so um, can you perhaps, you know, you, you've mentioned the Repmus exercise that yeah. was going on. Can you walk us through it as in for someone who might not be used oh, to course. having the, uh, the space element into the seabed warfare strategy? How does it work? What would be a normal operation in that case? Actually, the way we started off was we, we were able to find out that there's not the one perfect solution how to operate uh, a system. We, we tr started to um, recognize the different workflows depending on the different experiences of offices. Some offices are focusing on a surface, some offices are focusing on um, 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 AUV operations underwater, others from the air, others from space. So we defined it by workflows, for example, saying where do we start, where do we end? But by the end of the day, we want to answer questions like who did what when? Where, in what area, can we go back in time? Can we anticipate and predict behavior? And so therefore, for example, um, you take satellite imagery, um, you can go back into the archive of satellite providers and say, hey, wait a moment, two years ago, that ship has been here before, exactly with the same pattern. It may come back. So what do you do then? Um, you can, for example, drop sonar buoys and to prepare your area to get more information, to find out if they're dropping something underwater, if they're operating underwater. Or you do it the other way around. That's why I'm saying different workflows. Mm -hmm. You have sonar buoys somewhere anyhow, due to various reasons, and then you might find an acoustic signature. You find something, and then you would like to know more about this. Is it subsurface? Is it surface? Then you add in the next step, for example, satellite imagery. You check the archive or the current uh, satellite imagery and say, there's no contact on the surface, so most likely there might be something underwater. And again, that goes back to where do you put your limited uh, resources on, and then you can go into that area. And this is where it's just a supportive factor, not the overall solution, but it supports the uh, overall strategy. Mm -hmm. So if I'm understanding this correctly, you're working very much also on the merging of data mm. and making sense of this overload of data that is basically swamping whoever is working in these fields, right? So yes. are we talking also, like as you said, artificial intelligence, machine learning, like these keywords that also are coming into the picture? Definitely. And the interesting part is nothing of that is very brand new. Um, I would like to throw some numbers around. For example, on Instagram, we are creating on a daily basis, more than 100,000 gigabytes of data. And that app alone is capable of labeling it correctly so that we see what we most likely would like to see. For example, me personally, I would like uh, to, to see Lego, the latest development in Lego things. So therefore, that algorithm knows what I'm looking for. Mm. So how can we apply actually what is already existing in an area we, we are starting to gather the data or to merge the data we already have, but it's too much to process it manually by hand as we have done in the past. We mm. do need to do it more automatically. That's where these words come in. However, instead of creating everything from the beginning, why not looking at, for example, in companies who are already dealing with big data in a way we can adapt and learn from them. And this is kind of the creative part in it where we also need to learn for the strategies how to implement talk to companies that have nothing to do with any maritime topics and whatsoever, but for the digital processing of data, labeling, um, and so on and so on. So that is kind of the processing part. That's part of it we have done also during that exercise and also we are continuing to do so with companies who have already done their job to adapt similar mechanisms and procedures to the maritime domain. And that's very interesting. So small teams can really change the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, fantastic times for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have a question actually mm -hmm. from uh, from the audience, and this ties in quite nicely into what you have been mentioning. Also, Cedric, you know, you've all mentioned actually at some point that there needs to be some synergy between different uh, types of actors. Um, so the the audience is asking also, is there you know strength in combining the responsibilities between uh, military, security, commercial for the protection of the oceans? So you mentioned, for instance, that you know you also to be able to leverage the technology that you're developing, it's also very important for you to have all the actors involved to uh, come to see you and say, we need this, yeah. we, we, it would be great to look at this. So I was 
wondering, I'll start with you, but also would like to open up the question to everyone here. Like, what is the strength in seeing, you know, working with different um, areas of responsibility uh, for seabed protection? I tried to keep my answer short this time. <laughs> um, it has changed dramatically since no the Nord Stream 2 um, um, event. And because now there's a need, there's a political need, but also a factual need to work together and to exchange um, kind of not, not only the procedures and knowledge, but the way we, we see the maritime domain. It's a large area. And as a society in general, we are just unlocking that area. There's more becoming about uh, sustainability at the oceans, about uh, getting the deep mining um, processing and so on, getting resources from the ground. These are things that are just happening. So we need to talk with each other. And um, at actually, as a positive note, that's happening right at this moment, last week, the next week, and so on. We have ongoing discussions how we can finally work together and leverage the data everyone is actually having already in their stock. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. And what about you, Cédric, from the point of view of the French Navy? Yes, I agree with that. Uh, I think that there's a global consensus of uh, the different actors that are operating in, that, uh, in the domain of the deep sea. Um, to exchange, uh, I would say, to exchange information um, about uh, the different uh, activities. Um, but it is very similar to what we usually do in the maritime domain, I would say, for a long, long time now. Uh, you know, all the actors of the shipping industries uh, are encouraged to, to exchange information with the navies because actually we are we have common interest of, uh, of maintaining um, and free and open uh, space, marine, maritime space, whether it is uh, on the seabed or, or uh, on, the, on, the, on the surface, of course. So uh, I'm very confident uh, uh, on the fact that uh, we'll be able to, to, to make this ecosystem uh, work. Um, and the Navy is not, is not the leader, or the French Navy, I mean, is not the leader of that, uh, of that uh, uh, network. We are just one of the actors of the, of the network and we, and we share common interest uh, with the others. So it's, it's, it's pretty much working and it will uh, improve uh, very, very soon. <laughs> and before moving on to Oha and Joe, I actually had another question from the audience who was asking how you know, how can you start cooperation? What is the contact person for coordination and familiarization with new technologies? If I have a new technology, an idea, which is a breakthrough, how do I take this to the Marine Nationale, for instance? Yeah, OK. So uh, the good news is that we are organized to have this kind of, uh, to ap to have this kind of approach uh, towards new technology. So not only, of course, uh, for, for these uh, autonomous vehicles, going uh, under the sea. Uh, it is the, s the same in, in all the domains. It can see the same for, uh, for uh, uh, propulsion, for weapons, for, uh, for, for whatever, for aircrafts and so on. So this is a process of uh, innovation. And um, so I, I, I would prefer to give the floor to somebody <laughs> maybe more, uh, more expert in that. And maybe I could complement that after. Sure, no problem. Uh, so, oh, you know, what about you? How do you see this uh, this process of coordination, cooperation with different actors? Yeah, uh, um, I would say, uh, in my point of view and in the point of view of the industry, it's uh, a key success factors for this market. Um, we can say that in the maritime domain, uh, autonomous systems are not really evolved mm -hmm. yet mm -hmm. and we are still at the beginning of uh, the development but it's going really fast and recent uh, events that we largely covered <laughs> in the in the beginning of this uh, this conversation uh, have uh, really uh, increased the interest in such technologies so they, the the navies are in, in um, increasingly interested i'm i'm not sure we are uh, mature enough to know exactly what we want to do with these systems, uh, autonomous systems, but not only. And, and technologies are emerging also, innovation goes really fast. So the only way to keep up with the speed of the technology and the way uh, navies want to have first results is through collaboration. Mm. And one, one really interesting initiative that was launched by uh, the French DGA and, and Marine and the French Navy was uh, 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 an initiative called Perseus, mm -hmm. which enables industrial to offer 
um, uh, solutions to be tested in, in real life um, exercises. And it's a real win-win uh, experience for both industrials and, and ladies. But I hung with uh, Cedric compliments. Um, and to boost innovation, but also uh, integration in the operational concepts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you want to add something to this? Um, yes, maybe. Um, uh, first, I would like to underline also the role um, of the uh, Agence de l'Innovation Défense, Defense Innovation Agency, which is, which is normally um, the, 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 the proper framework for this kind of uh, new technologies and to, to, um, to study uh, what kind of technologies could have a military development and implementation. And talking about uh, Perseus, yes, we are pretty much uh, happy with this uh, initiative uh, that we first um, uh, developed uh, last year during a, a, a huge exercise um, uh, that was called Orion. The idea behind that is to offer a kind of an uh, operational framework to test um, the, the operational advantage that we could uh, um, take from uh, new systems. And it, so that's not easy, that's maybe easy to, to say, but that's not easy to organize um, because you need, uh, you need time, you need money, you need uh, uh, assets, uh, you need to organize the, the proper circumstances in which you want to test your system. And, and now it's, it's working um, uh, and it's, it's, uh, the, the future of this initiative will be very interesting and uh, we will soon also have a new exercise uh, in, the, in the MED in which we will test uh, different uh, um, under a AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, yeah, so, so this, is a, this is a way to, to address the question of the proliferation of new systems, mm -hmm. the different innovations. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you very much, both of you, for, uh, for showing actually uh, live the cooperation between the French Navy and the industry. Before moving uh, closely to what Naval Group is doing, I wanted to give Joe a chance to answer also uh, the question on cooperation with different actors. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I guess um, our, our, our heritage is to the companies that we work with. They, they have a background in having worked in ocean sciences and in the energy market. Uh, underwater, so cooperation with navies to to make transition successful is is critical, and I'm I'm glad to hear about the initiatives in in France. I, I was hearing earlier about Redmus. Redmus is another great example of where industry comes together with navies uh, and 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 does exercises in, I guess, quasi operational scenarios. They're so not like fully on uh, operational, but. Um, it, it is happening, and it's um, and I I feel like it's been done well now, uh, in places uh, across the world. In in the UK, we have uh, the, the the DASA um, Defense um, uh, Accelerator and oh, the joys of yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, it it's it, it's great. We're we're being innovative. We're testing innovation. The the, the critical link that's missing is how does that transition to the fleet? We're demonstrating capability, we're showing what we can do, but, but it's being done at a pace that is different and works different to standard procurements within navies. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think navies and commercial companies need to do is work together as to how do we, how do we translate you know, buying a huge platform into buying lots of smaller ones that are being used in different niche scenarios that are going to complement what we're doing, and I think, I think there's still work to be done on that. But uh, and and I can understand why somebody would be asking that question because when you are faced with the myriad of opportunities to work with a navy, sometimes it can be confusing as to like, where am I? You know, what am I going to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I hear that a lot yeah. actually from uh, also startups yeah. and everything. It can be quite complicated. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Oha, you've already kind of alluded a little bit to what mm -hmm. Naval Group is doing uh, to support also the French seabed warfare strategy. Could you give us a bit more of a detailed information. Yeah, sure. Uh, just maybe first uh, give you a, a short uh, reminder of uh, what Naval Groups uh, uh, is doing. So we, we have uh, 400 years uh, naval, naval expertise. Uh, we are specialized is in naval domain. And we design, uh, produce uh, and uh, maintain uh, submarines, surface ships, 
big ones or uh, small ones, <laughs> um, underwater weapons and, and combat systems. And uh, uh, we work for the French Navy, but, but also for uh, foreign ones. One of the key strengths of our, our uh, um, positioning is to be uh, present all along the value chain. We uh, design uh, platforms and, and combat systems, but we also integrate them on the ships and perform the maintenance. So we ha really have this uh, overall performance uh, interest. Uh, regarding uh, autonomous systems, uh, as I said, we, we invested in it and we have a portfolio of uh, various systems to uh, be able to uh, discuss with the navies on what they, what they need and, and test different, uh, different uh, possibilities. Uh, I, I have a, a video that can show, uh, for example, in the underwater um, domain, we have uh, worked on uh, an extra large autonomous underwater vehicle uh, who can uh, perform its own mission mm -hmm. in the seabed warfare, but also uh, other missions. It has uh, controlled decision-making autonomy uh, and, and it can also um, deploy and communicate with smaller uh, system, autonomous systems. Uh, here again for a seabed warfare, seabed awareness or, a, or other missions. Um, and we have a demonstrator, uh, which is uh, 10 meter meters long and weighing about 10 tons. And it's, uh, it, it has performed these uh, trials and is currently used to uh, test use cases, uh, new technologies and payloads. Uh, thanks to our expertise in uh, torpedoes, we also have a medium-sized uh, autonomous underwater vehicle, uh, um, which can also be used for a um, seabed awareness uh, situation, uh, uh, situation awareness, um, environment recognition, or, uh, or uh, ISR. Um, so it can be used in uh, various kinds of, uh, of missions. Uh, we also have some uh, surface vehicles, autonomous vehicles, mm -hmm. and, and with the same spirit uh, to cover the, the, the whole panel from small um, uh, systems to uh, medium, medium ones, and to be able to test uh, uh, new, new use cases, to deploy other uh, autonomous systems and, uh, and uh, test new technologies. But beyond the, 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 the uncrewed systems, we also work on the integration in the ships or uh, on shore uh, or e even on the submarines, uh, both physically and uh, functionally. And uh, we have deployed uh, and developed a drone mission system that can uh, help in the preparation, execution and, and uh, feedback from uh, the operation missions. Uh, it can be integrated uh, and connected to the combat system of the of the boat uh, of the crewed um, ships, and then really act as a, uh, an extended sensor or effector of the fleet. Mm -hmm. So we have really a, a wide range of systems. Uh, we also work on uh, launch and reco recovery uh, activities, docking stations. Uh, it can be useful in some uh, seabed applications. Um, and, and not to mention uh, maintenance, uh, training and simulations, which are also important. Yeah. So I know you had a, a little video, so the, um, we're going to show it now uh, while we're <laughs> talking sure about the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, because you know you, you've talked about you've covered a lot of grounds yeah. here. Uh, so you've talked about you know from uh, small to medium to XL UUVs, yeah. and you've talked also about um, the system that integrates all of this together, and then you've talked about the launch and recovery of these systems. So I was wondering, uh, as I asked Patrick earlier on, perhaps if you can talk us through how all this can work together, you know, how do mm. you see it as Naval Group as a, as, as a one sort of domain awareness uh, system? Yeah, sure. Um, and it's really important to, to see that um, uh, an uncrewed system alone can be really uh, interesting and can uh, achieve uh, some, some missions, but uh, thinking it in its uh, environment and uh, with other means uh, can really uh, uh, put an emphasis on the overall operational performance. Mm -hmm. uh, so as I said, we have uh, some, uh, some uh, 
um, we make sure that our uh, uncrewed systems are connected to the combat system and and, and uh, unable to work in a, in the overall fleet. Um, and we also always keep in mind that uh, there is the uh, the uh, uncrewed system that we have, but can also uh, deploy other systems um, to. And uh, as it's shown on the on the on the screen, uh, you can deploy it from a submarine, for example. But then it can itself, uh, while remaining unseeable. Uh, deploy other uh, other systems and perform its mission uh, discreetly uh, and with uh, uh, no one <laughs> knowing about it. We hope. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> but then it it, it poses uh, technical challenges. And maybe we we come back to to this later. But um, autonomous navigation, uh, communication, and connectivity. Mm -hmm. Uh, ability to to avoid obstacles and to optimize the trajectory uh, are, are technologies that are common to all kinds of un uncrewed systems. If we talk more specifically about um, seabed warfare, uh, as Cedric said, there are a lot of missions. But uh, for example, if you want to go very deep, those systems have to withstand the pressure. Mm -hmm. If you want to do a recognition uh, mission, you have to remain discreet and not be uh, uh, seen. If you want to follow cable, submarine cables for a long distance, then you have to manage uh, uh, the autonomy in energy management. You have to be able to reconfigure if you uh, find obstacles on your way. Uh, and you have also to be resilient to cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is also a key a key factor in this kind of um, of, of uh, activities, and maybe one last example of uh, and it was mentioned earlier, but um, I talked about to, um, about uh, controlled decision making autonomy. Mm -hmm. This is the the ability to set uh, high object high le high level objectives to uh, the uncrewed system, and then. You just put some boundaries in terms of time or space, and it's able to uh, set up its own mission in its own trajectory. Um, this offers a, a variety of uh, options uh, quite wide. It's not pre-programmed, and, and you can more easily face the unexpected. Uh, but we do that with always keeping the human in the loop. Uh, with uh, a supervising uh, option, and when the, the uncrewed system wants to change someone something in his course, he asks for validation. Mm -hmm. This is a really a, a key differentiator uh, in in the autonomous systems uh, approach, and and it re requires uh, artificial intelligence, uh, man machine teaming, advanced robotics, uh, which we already discussed about. Right. Well, thank you, Aha. And uh, before, as you said, you know, we're going to be asking a lot of questions to Joe about the challenges of underwater uh, warfare and communication and positioning. But perhaps before um, doing that, I just wanted to ask one last question. You know, you've talked about cooperation. You've talked about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the video we've seen also a lot of assets cooperating with each other. Um, you know, you've, you're innovating quite a lot. Are there any specific challenges that you as a company have identified or had to work with mm -hmm. uh, or are working with? In fact, you, you know, there's nothing wrong in admitting that there are still yeah. a few things to work on. Of course, there are many challenges. Uh, even if you remember what, uh, what I said in the, in the beginning of my, my speech, we, are, we have 400 years of history, and mm. we build. We are used to build submarines, aircraft carrier. So um, we are used to uh, long-term uh, activities. This is not possible in the autonomous systems uh, market. So we have a real challenge to speed up mm. and to uh, keep up with the pace of this market. One one other. Um, interesting challenge for us is that most players uh, come from the civil industry. 
they have already experience in offshore activities or, uh, or uh, uh, telecommunications. Um, so they can come with new te technologies that are not new for them, but new in naval operations. So here again, we have to, to keep up and, and to be able to go really fast. Mm -hmm. And um, we have decided to take on the challenge. <laughs> Uh, but uh, being completely aware that we have to change our ways of working, our processes, to uh, work in short development cycles. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the platforms that uh, I talked about earlier and all the demonstrators that we can capita capitalize on are real uh, key strengths for us. So we can experiment, design, experiment and, and learn from it very quickly. We, we try to have really short loop decision, decision loops and, and to apply the uh, test and learn approach. And um, maybe uh, another important thing we didn't much talk about, but, uh, about it, but it's important to keep in mind that most of these systems will have to be really cost effective. Mm because uh, in many cases they have to be considered as expendable. Mm -hmm. so this is also a challenge for uh, all the Navy uh, uh, and as industries <laughs> maybe <Yeah. laughs> you can uh, um, agree on that. Uh, so we always keep that in mind. How can we make it simple but rea reliable and easily reconfigurable? Uh, so many, many aspects. and, and we, we won't do it al alone. Uh, we can. Uh, we have the chance that, uh, to be able to uh, leverage on a large network of industrial and academic partners. Mm -hmm. uh, we work together with them to integrate their existing technologies or uh, work in a partnership model to develop new new systems that we can uh, integrate uh, on in in our uh, products and maybe. Well, not the last, because there are many ones, but uh, uh, a challenge which is particularly important to me is that we have to dare and we have to accept that there is a certain level of risks that we need to take mm. uh, to be efficient, fast and, and, uh, and really give uh, what the Navy needs. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's also a state of man. Yes, absolutely. And I heard a little yes coming from Cédric when you said <laughs> it's good to keep them at a decent price. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, Joe, we're yeah. coming to you. I'm getting a lot of questions actually yeah. from the audience in terms of what does it mean to make all of this interact in, yeah. a, in a domain? I mean, I'm a defense you know, writer and I, I dwell a lot into um, the um, underwater domain, so I know the challenges, but can you remind me some of the key challenges in terms of working in underwater? Yeah, I mean, I guess, um, and, and, and I'm not a physicist, but when it comes to the underwater environment, um, you, you don't have, and some of the audience will find that they know this already, but you don't have access to electromagnetic waves in the same way that you do when you work on air. So you have to work with acoustics typically. There, there are uses for electromagnetic waves, there are uses for optical systems for comms as well. Uh, but traditionally, if you want to achieve range, you want to use acoustics. And acoustics come with a small bandwidth compared to anything else that you might be used to. And, and when that happens, then you have to start thinking about, okay, what, what information is critical to me? Uh, how do I share it? Um, how do I, you know, if, if I'm bringing uncrewed systems into the picture, you know, what, what are the effective ranges in which I want to be talking to them? Um, and what does it mean that I'm using acoustics? Because if you're being active mm. uh, with acoustics, immediately somebody will be able to, you know, find out that you're there. So it's, for a lot of navies, acoustics are a bad thing, you know, it's like, well, active acoustics are a terrible <laughs> thing. It's like, oh, immediately I'm telling people where I'm at. So it, it really does come to having that conversation as to, you know, trying to uh, leverage on the heritage that industry has worked on where there's no requirement for passive acoustics traditionally. You, you use passive acoustics not because you have to, but just because you want to. Um, and, and then try and picture a scenario uh, in the future where you are using active acoustics because you are using more systems that are more expendable, they're cheaper. Uh, actually, you might be using passive acoustics because you do want to let them know that you're there. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, there's th that's what we need to do. And 
and, and a lot of work that needs to be done is reconsider the vital space. So uh, in, in oil and gas operations, uh, we work at 2,000, 3,000 meters depth, mm -hmm. and we communicate vertically from the surface to the seafloor. So we'll have systems, we'll put in monitoring systems, we'll put acoustic modems, and we'll monitor them and talk to them vertically. There's a lot of instruments out there, and our technology partner, Sonardyne, has them available off the shelf that are great at communicating vertically. Mm -hmm. But now we're asking to communicate horizontally. Now the systems are really good at doing are really good at doing that, but they haven't necessarily been designed to do that. So now we need to think about okay, what we need to think about modeling the environment in ways that we haven't necessarily modeled them before. We need to start thinking about okay, how how can we get the best use of the system? There's work being done in in the UK. Uh, DSDL uh, funded a program called Forces, P-H-O-R-C-Y-S, um, which developed uh, a, a standard open waveform, um, which is very effective. Uh, it operates over different frequencies, enabling different ranges uh, from tens to hundreds of kilometers. Um, but as, as you increase that range, your, your bandwidth comes down. So you go from having being able to share your status and your health and maybe where you are to being able to say yes or no. <laughs> um, but it's, it, again, it, it goes back uh, to what Patrick was saying. If, it, it's, uh, if you have the right AI on board the platforms, if you have the right mechanisms to work with that data, you shouldn't require that much data. So I think, yeah, there's, there's lots of challenges. They're all exciting challenges. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is capability that you can bring to make a difference. I mean, currently we're able to track eight divers from a single system, monitor their health status as they're doing training operations. Uh, we've done work in the commercial domain, uh, which is not in the public domain, uh, where we're talking about tracking hundreds of s systems underwater. So, you know, there's, there's the technologies out there. It's, it's just how, how you fit them. Um, interesting outside of the communications is also what needs to be communicated and how much intelligence goes in the vehicles. Um, you talked about the endurance of the AUVs and you talked about the navigation. Um, we develop navigation systems and navigation systems interestingly buy your endurance because mm. if you have all the batteries in the world if, if you lose your exactly. north if you don't know where you are then you know you just have a very large battery, so it's it's all tied together mm -hmm. uh, across our group of companies. Uh, we develop obstacle avoidance sonars, uh, we develop uh, multi aperture sonars, uh, we develop optical systems to explore the seafloor, um, and those are going to be critical sensors because the platforms are great, but the the instruments and the software that goes on, this plat on those platforms are going to, in a sense, decide whether the platforms will be successful or not. Mm. Um, so that's, that's something that I think, again, the instruments are there, but we need to have this conversation. And it is about collaboration, about understanding, you know, how do we want to configure those systems? What's the mission requirement? How, you know, what do those platforms need to look at? What is the right uh, sensor mix to achieve uh, what we need to do. Um, yeah. Again, I, I, I don't know if that made sense. Oh, it completely <laughs> does. And I think it ties really yeah. well into everything we've been discussing yeah. today, where we, everyone has been saying we really need yeah. to communicate with each other. And I've been seeing you two actually, you know, yeah. uh, talking we a lot. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll have a little sapphire side chat. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, Joe, you know, you've mentioned just one last question, as I'm yeah. aware that the time is unfortunately flying, but you've mentioned also positioning. Yeah. And I think, and, and I know you and I have had this conversation for my articles before when we talk in communications we're talking also positioning yeah the two are like very closely linked together because how do you you know you can't use gps underwater so yeah. how do you know where you are yeah so uh, again i mean and, and there's been talk about docking stations so we've already done work with docking stations where you would have an acoustic beacon that you can use to communicate from afar but also it's a, it's a guiding beacon for where you need to get to so you, you, any acoustic signal is going to give you, if it's active uh, and it responds, it's going to give you a range, a time 
and if you do the equations, you'll get a range to somewhere. Um, if you know how you're moving or if you have more than one receiver, you can triangulate the position of where you need to get to. Mm. So there's a simple element of, you know, the same uh, methods that we use to, to, to localize ourselves acoustically underwater can be used to also share data. Uh, as you get closer to a docking station, then you can go to really short um, um, range systems using opticals, for instance, optical systems, so free space optical modems. This can be used to transfer real time data to the AUV and from the AUV, mm. uh, even HD video. So at this point, you're wirelessly manually uh, conducting the docking operation, should you wish to. And, and that's been demonstrated already uh, in. Um, I forget the year, maybe, maybe it was pre-COVID, right. 2019 maybe. <laughs> um, or yeah, we, we did some demonstrations uh, with uh, Saab. So yeah, th th those, th those systems exist. And I, and I think it's, um, there, th 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 there's a lot to be done with acoustics. Um, we, we developed seafloor sensors for the commercial domain they, 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 and, and also the uh, ocean sciences domain where we'll deploy them to be in the seafloor for 10 years at a time. Um, and there'll be on each side, one example on each side of a tectonic plate. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll just go there with an anchored surface vessel every so often, harvest data from them, uh, box them in to work out their position. Uh, they're ranging to each other all the time. And we're taking all of that data and then we can very accurately measure the centimetric movement of those tectonic plates. Um, you know, you could do anything that you want. But the beauty with this is any of those systems that's at, down there and um, sitting there passively until it gets queried um, can be used to provide a positioning uh, reference to anybody that comes close, any, any friendly person that comes close. There's obviously a risk that somebody might pick them up and take them away, but there's lots of things that can be done for that as well. You know? um, but uh, again, it's, it's about trying to understand the technology and then looking at the mission profiles and saying, you know, what, what you, you talked about Lego earlier, you know, so w how, how are we going to put the business together, you know, and just do something that's useful with them. Thank you. And, yeah. I, and I like that you actually yeah. referenced to Patrick because yeah. I was going to bring Patrick back into the conversation as a, to, to help the conclusion. Is there anything that you would like to add in terms of what we've just discussed with the Hong and Joe, with all these communications, this system going back and forth and everything? How does that fit into your picture? Yeah, absolutely. So building on everything that has been said before, I mean, we see a lot of trends and technologies and so on, on things that has been done several years ago or being adopted or um, invented reinvented at the moment and put them all together in a different scope. Um, the question here also goes back to the question we have heard earlier about coordination, mm -hmm. right? Um, are we going the right way? Are we signaling from, for example, the authorities that this is the right way? Is this what we need to answer those questions? Is this the development that is sustainable also for a company so to survive also the, the economic changes and so on um, in, in this market, especially in a 400 years perspective? Um, and, and I would like to highlight here this um, conversation also there are um, offices that are tra starting to deal with these questions and to go from the technical and conceptual all the way also to the political level and um, other way around. For example, beginning of this year, th from the NATO perspective, NATO um, has established a new office um, for the undersea infrastructure coordination, the UACC undersea infrastructure coordination cell. It's a beginning, but it's a sign but actually um, executable already. Um, that team is on the road starting to have these discussions with the industry to, to also scale and scope what's going on out there. But that's from the NATO perspective, um, more from a political perspective, more on the, let's say, operational perspective, the NATO Allied Maritime Command, in Northwood, UK, a kind of the maritime Navy arm from NATO is also having a closer look. There's also changes recognizable to see. And if a question comes up, for example, whom should I call, right? Who do you call? There are people waiting now. They are ready to meet. When you go to the conferences and so on, this is not like, oh, this is secrecy, we cannot talk about this, has changed. Mm -hmm. And if you approach these persons and can say to the audience, go to these persons, ask for the UACC, ask for NATO Marcom, and there are also NATO Center of Excellences out there, small in numbers, but still very helpful to get the operational view into the context, and they are also willing to help. For example, the project you have asked um, earlier last week, also in Redmos, we have presented is with one of the uh, European Naval uh, CUEs, the uh, C, um, um, 
Center of Excellence for Operations in Confined and Shadow Waters in northern Germany, but open for all the nations. These are all entities uh, trying to support from both sides, industry, civil governments, and um, going back to the, to the defense sector. Yeah. This is one of the parts I wanted to say, yeah. No, thank you, thank you. And it's good you mentioned NATO because this was one of the questions oh, we also had that we didn't have time to get to, but someone was asking what's the role of NATO and the EU. Um, so, and uh, Cedric, do you have any concluding word with everything that you've listened here today, the, all the exchanges we've had, anything you want to add to conclude? Yeah, well, I, th I think that uh, time was missing to speak a little bit uh, more and to elaborate on the, the partnership dimension. Dim dimension. Mm -hmm. With uh, within NATO, for mm -hmm. instance, as, as it was said before, but also with with other countries uh, all around the world. There's a lot of countries, of course, that are uh, drawing the same conclusions that we did here in, in Europe and in France. So there's a general interest uh, to be able to, to 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 operate, to act in this domain, and and to face uh, some kind of the new threats that uh, that we are encountering there. Um, and as a conclusion, I would like also to to speak a little bit about. Um, another dimension, which is uh, uh, one of the consequences of, of these autonomous systems that uh, we need uh, to, 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 to deal with, the, to face with these threats. Uh, when we speak about uh, autonomous systems, we speak a lot about data. Mm -hmm. That means that um, the Navy, as an institution, needs to be organized to deal with that enormous flow of data. So, uh, so this is why we also organized to, to address this digital evolution or, or kind of revolution mm -hmm. to be able to process, to store, to safely operate those data. And this is a dimension, so it's not specific to, to seabed warfare, but uh, seabed warfare is also a, a fundamental trigger to make uh, our navies more digital. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, again, as I said, we could be discussing this for a very long time, uh, but unfortunately for today, this will be all. So it's been a real pleasure having the four of you here today. Really, I'm very happy with all the conversations we've had. And I'm also thankful to the audience for all the questions that you've sent through. I've tried to address as many of them as I could, but unfortunately, as you know, as well as we do, time flies. So this will be all for us today. Uh, again, thank you so much. And don't forget that this is a series of events, so there should be one coming up in the next few months so stay tuned for more of this and uh, if you want to talk to any of our experts today you've had their names so I'm sure we'll be able to put you in contact somehow thank you so much for listening thank you for being here today it's been great and uh, stay tuned we'll see you soon bye <laughs>